Good morning, listeners. Welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. I'm your co-host, David Robertson, and I'm here today with... Christopher Carter, and we are here today um, by the good graces of the British Association for the Study of Religions and the North American Association for the Study of Religions. We are indeed. And this week's podcast, which I will send us on towards with no further ado, is uh, entitled Video Games and Religious Studies, and it's an interview with Greg Grieve, recorded by our good friend David McConaughey. So, take it away. Hello, my name is David McConaughey. Today I'm here at the 2015 American Academy of Religion meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm joined by Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies, Gregory Grieve. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Greg teaches at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, and he's the author now of, of several items, uh, including uh, forthcoming with Rutledge, Cyber Zen, uh, co edited with Heidi Campbell, Playing with Religion and Digital Games, uh, as well co edited with Daniel Weidling, Pixel in the Lotus. Today, we're going to talk about the new venture that he's undertaken at the conference here, which is really to bring the study of video gaming uh, to. Uh, the organization of the American Academy of Religion. And uh, what he's going to tell us about today is if you would like to bring some of the academic work that they've been doing uh, at the conference and trying to figure out how to get that kind of stuff into your classroom, where you might be are, he's going to explain how that works for him uh, and how that uh, interest in uh, video games turned into productive scholarship on video games, turned into pedagogy in the classroom that students can Perhaps I've I've framed him too much here, but he's going to have to say so. So, Greg, tell us um, how did you first get for you video games in your head as a, a scholar working in religious studies? Um, so, I was working in digital religion already, and I was doing that, and also I was teaching Hinduism. And when I teach Hinduism, I leave the last five or six sessions. The students get to choose the subject matter. It's just kind of to keep things fresh. And so they wanted to look at um, video games. And at the time, the only video game that I could find that related to it was on Hanuman Boy Warrior, which was the first video game produced solely in India. And so so I used that in my class. um, And then the next year I was teaching a course on digital religion and I decided to incorporate video games, which I hadn't thought about doing before. And so... Do you think, why especially was it that video games hadn't occurred to you prior to that moment? I, I think that um, if, if you could imagine a cultural food chain with opera and high art on the top, video games would be down near the bottom, maybe just above pornography. So this is the, the highbrow, lowbrow... Yeah, Right, and so I think I think it just never occurred to me um, that it would be a legitimate form of scholarship. And again, I realize in retrospect that that is idiotic, right? Right, but, right, right. Um, but, but your students wanted it too, right? They they recognized that after you had presented conventional academic scholarship, that there was an interest in gaming that they had at the end. Right. So they, you know, so again, this this was originally driven by. Um, their interest in studying Hinduism and video games, um, which is not, you know, um, and so that's where it started. And then the next year after I did that, I taught my digital religion course. And in the past, you know, we looked at websites, we looked at YouTube, we looked at apps, but I'd never looked at video games before. And so I decided to incorporate video games this time. Um, And I found it very productive but very difficult um, because there was nowhere on campus where you could send students. There was no gaming lab at that point. Right. So your initial foray into presenting the games in the classroom, did you you open the games in the classroom and show them? Did you you show video clips of the game? Did you talk about the games and they played them outside of the classroom? How did that so, so originally I did, I showed some of the games and what I wanted to do was look at the religion in mainstream games. So, um, and that's what the I would... The triple A kind of... Yeah, so the... Um, and, uh, and so what I would do is I would show some videos about them and then I would organize the students to 
go and play the games on their own. And it was very difficult because uh, it was, it was high, a lot of logistics were involved because a few people had gaming consoles, but, you know, and how to organize people outside of class to did, go. Did that, did that predispose the games you selected, perhaps, and then uh, perhaps influence the kinds of people that might have been interested in such a course? I, I'm not sh- I mean, I don't know if they knew what they were getting themselves into when they took it, so, but, but I did. A surprise, perhaps. Yeah. But I do think it influenced the games I was looking at because it's the games that people had. Right. So, but that changed eventually for you. Right. And so, and, and, and another thing I wanted to do, this was happening at the same time, was that in the, um, in the digital religion class, I didn't want to have the students just do traditional print-based scholarship. I wanted them to be able to do digital scholarships. I wanted them to be able to create videos and websites. And Mo- model in response the form that you have studied. Right. And so I wanted, and so, and again, there was no place on campus to do that either. Um, and so um, the first thing I had to do, and you know, this is all like seven years ago now, is that I helped create two different things at the university. One was the DMC, which is the Digital Media Center. And so this is a, this is an incredible, and I got to say, I was not the only person. This, the librarians really helped do this, right? They got the, they were, they got on board. Yeah, the librarians are always helpful. If it wasn't for the librarians, none of this would exist. Uh-huh. So, so, so initially, the DMC, the Digital Media Center, and is it still perhaps run out of? The yeah, library? so it's it's run out of the library. Um, it's it's at this point, it's one of the most popular places on campus, and it's because yeah, well, it's because we made it really user friendly. So it's got like all these kind of um, there's beanbag chairs and comfy couches, and and so we we tried to make this inviting, uh, really inviting uh, environment. Um, we were helped with a Title Three grant which is basically what funded it. Right. So, I mean, the funding is important. We shouldn't probably ignore, ignore the fact if, if, in some measure, you can describe what level of funding you think. If someone else wanted to go to their library and say, hey, I want the bare bones of uh, this idea that I heard about a space for students to go and play video games, what, what would you say to them? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think... It's not a cheap undertaking, and as a public institution under a lot of budget pressure at the moment, we could not have done it without outside help. So, so grants, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but grants, probably within reason for anyone to consider, right? These are not million dollar grants. Oh no, 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 no. We're talking five thousand. We're talking ten thousand. Ten thousand. So yeah. that's entirely reasonable. Right, and and but the thing is, you have to have buy-in from the library. Would not have been because they're staffing it. Right. So, so how how did you pitch it to the library, or how did the pitch go to the library? The the library was um, they were remarkably on board from the start, and I think it's something that they wanted to do. Um, and, um, and and so yes, yeah, so, I mean it was it really you know they and and basically I gave them the idea we we worked together, but they did really did a lot of the the work when it came to the DMC. Right. Um, and the, and. At the same time, we were doing the DMC. We were doing the um, uh, digital media across the curriculum, DAX. Okay. And DAX is, I don't know if people have like writing intensive curriculum or speaking intensive across the curriculum. So DAX is a version of that, um, which is that there's people who will come to your classroom and teach about how to make a website, how to make an app, how to make a video. So there's people in the library now, undergraduates for the most part, who we train, who are trained to go in, into the classroom and teach students how to do these. And and so without without that side, the gaming side wouldn't exist, right? So I mean, there's a, these kind of grew up together. So it was student effort, instructor effort, library effort, institutional effort, a grant effort. So all these kind of factors come together. So beyond beanbags and the social no. vibrancy of the space, which I think I have to say sounds really attractive. Yeah. Right? Uh, what else is it about the space? So in, it so in the space, you know, there, there's um, there's computers um, for video editing. There's computers for website construction and app construction. We have a 3D printer now. Um, but mostly, I think, th- there was computer labs before, but there wasn't the... Even more important in the computer labs was having the staffing to teach about how to use the things. So are there, are there regular instruction for both faculty mm-hmm. and, and students on yeah, how so, to use the items? Yeah, so, and, and, and you know, how, what I envision would be if you as an instructor, um, the, the same way if you, 
way if you give a writing and a writing project to a student, they can go to the writing center and get help. You can give them a website, and they can go to the website. Right. And and the, and the reason I I came up with this is in a digital religion class, I was teaching them how to do it myself, and it was taking up so much class time that there was almost no room for content. Right. Perhaps today that's maybe slightly less of yeah. a problem than it used to be. If, if I wanted my students to create a blog, uh, WordPress is you know a, f- a five to ten minute installation, signing up and getting your first thing online. You have to make a lot of compromises, right? right when you do that, uh, maybe the format that you're getting, you're not going to have them adjust the format, or you know, so the website might be limited in its construction. Uh, but at least that allows the the opportunity, right, for them to uh, to pursue far more advanced instruction, right. and advanced work, to really realize the, the vision that they might have. Right, and the interesting thing is because we have the um, digital media across the curriculum, um, uh, what is even better is that people will come in and will teach them the aesthetics about the best practices. Design practices. Design practices, yeah, which is great. Practices. Right, yeah. So they'll come in and, you know, basically, um, you know, I'll say, come and give them best practices about website design. Come in, and we actually do a, what's really interesting is we do one on PowerPoint. Um, and the, uh, and usually the students are like, you know, I've been PowerPoint, I've been making PowerPoint since before I was born, basically, right? Yeah. But then they actually go through the pra- the best practices, and they, a lot of times, I, I find that that's one of their favorite classes, because it makes them completely rethink this, this, Thing, uh, this practice that they've been doing. I remember the first time that I read Ed Tuft and, and the visual uh, organization of design and yeah. information, and I just, I just had had no idea, no idea about the layers that that went into the production of such materials, and uh, see how he's he's really excoriated now. I think. Yeah. kind of PowerPoint design, how all the whole community, right, of educators and producers have said, look, we've all been doing this <laughs> wrong, right? It's right, yeah, so, wrong. yeah, yeah, so it's really interesting, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, and, and again, um, so, but ta- besides the intellectual content and knowledge that they're bringing away from the class, they're also bringing away um, a whole skill set of, of digital media, not only how to do it, but best practices, which I think flow into other classes. So what, what I'm hearing you say is that first, there, there had to be some sort of realized effort to see the object that you wanted to bring in the class was valuable. The library seemed to accept that vision initially. Uh, you seemed to get the funding for it, and it seems that the students were receptive to it. So once the material is in there, and now they have access to it, and you can produce some of uh, the student work that you're looking for, mm-hmm. Uh, what's the scholarship side of your work? What well, kinds of things do you do? But, but let, me just, let me just add one more thing before I get to the scholarship side. So as, as part of the DMC, kind of as an afterthought, we put a gaming lab in. And this was the game changer, right? And so it's really a small space. It's only about maybe 20 by 20. And inside of it is four consoles, uh, four monitors and some consoles. And that's all it is. That's all it is. And, that's all, and, and, and we purchased... Um, a number of video games. Right. And so that was a game changer for me uh, because it allowed me to um, basically assign the games and not have to worry about the logistics of where they're going to play it. Right. You could say, go to the, here's the game, go to the lab, right. it's there, yeah. here's the lab's out. Yeah, and it was, you know, so it, it took a lot of the... I was, I, before that, I was hearing a lot of excuses about why I couldn't... We couldn't get together yeah. and... Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the gaming lab, and, and I teach, you know, so I teach three times a week with a digital uh, religion and video game course, and one day of the week we go into the gaming lab. Yeah. So describe what happens when you enter that cl- that classroom space. Yeah. So you know, so you, um, I've broken the class down into groups of four students. And so there's usually four students around the monitor. One will be playing the game. One will usually be looking up material online about the game. And one will be taking notes. And, and so the whole point of the class is to approach the games as a critical practice. So I'm having them reflect upon the games, not just play them. Was that, was that three people or four people? Well, it's usually, there's usually one person sitting on a beanbag one, chair. Yeah, one person's <laughs> kind of observing the whole process. Yeah. So, but usually, you know, I, I, and, and I, you know, I, I have them consciously take on those different roles. Right. 
Yeah. So that role playing is the the hallmark of good group design too, right? right? Yeah. The the narrator, the one who's leading, the one who's following the time, perhaps the one who's taking notes, right? And it's making sure that they're staying on task. Right? right. So when you're playing the video game in that role, have, have you given them a set of criteria for play? Yeah. So I set the class up through um, what I call quest labs, and these are um, their assignments in which they have to go into the video game environment and complete some type of task. Um, so uh, I think most of the audience at this point probably has heard of, of Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Has Minecraft been one of the ones that you Yeah, use? so I do use Minecraft. Um, and what I have them do with Minecraft is a slightly different than the other games um, because we study, we, we do a, a unit on sacred architecture. Right. And then I have them go and design the sacred architecture yeah. And so a very specific task, though, within it. Do you yeah. suggest to them that they should um, use uh, creative mode so that everything is accessible to them, or do you encourage them to go and uh, uh, play a survivalist? We, 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 um, I, I tell them to make a conscious choice and let me know why they made that choice. Right. So, so what kinds of things have you seen uh, when, when, when they do this? I've made all sorts of things. Um, we read an article in there on... on um, Southern barbecue, and you know this is just in the class. We're talking about popular culture, so we we read an article on southern barbecue and how um, uh, basically the argument is made that uh, southern barbecue is really the southern form of the Eucharist because uh, that's when people get together over the communion of the meal, right? Right. And so the, one of the funniest ones was a pig sacrifice temple. Nice. Yeah, but there's also you know real, um, and then people try to redo. People have done really beautiful. Buddhist temples, like, you know, mimic from real life. Someone made a temple to Zelda. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, and, and again, I'm trying to get them, um, part of what I'm trying to do is get the cobwebs out of their, their brains and let them creatively approach the subject. And so what I do is I give them um, an article that basically lists the qualities of sacred architecture. I tell them they have to use four of these right. in, in the design and then to critically reflect upon how they did that. So... Framing this all within religious studies, right? right. Now you've incorporated sacred architecture. Uh, if you were not, if you were doing that same assignment without the game, if you're doing a conventional written response, what would we lost that the game that the game brings to assignment? Like that? If I gave my students uh, a, a list of the qualities of sacred architecture and I asked them to write a response, right, uh, write a short summary of the argument, what what? doesn't that do what well, the game does? I, even though there's no body involved in the video game because you're online, I think the embodied qualities of being around sacred space are much more become much more conspicuous when you have that kind of 3D sandbox environment. So, so in that sense, it would be an analog for an assignment that called on students to go and visit a local church. Yeah. But it's still not quite the same. Right, and and, um, and because they're the ones constructing the categories, it helps them, I think, reflect upon what they consider to be. So, so what I think is really interesting about that, right? Category construction is at the heart of the way that your students participate in the projects that you set up. I think right? it is. Yeah, they can't not participate. They have to, if you gave them eight things and told them they had to do four, they had to choose which four to do, and then they had to decide to do them in a particular way, which is so Yeah, so, so, so another one, another, the first assignment I do is I give them Jay-Z Smith's Imagining Religion, and I give, you know, which he basically argues that religion is solely the category of the skull. Yeah. And, um, and then I have them go into Skyrim, and I have them find a religious thing, Everywhere and, in Skyrim, right, right, and then but then they have to argue on why this is religious. Yes, and so that's another that's a fun yeah. one too. So I'm hearing you say, and, and I and I think probably perhaps independently, right, having read your work and uh, uh, studied some of the scholarship on games, that there's every reason that these items belong in the classroom. They're not just belong in the classroom, but but are really productive and enjoyable to use. Yeah, and, and again, I think. Um, I can't get into it because of time, but because of censorship laws and in the, in the early 80s, this notion that religion doesn't have 
uh, the video games don't have religion in it is actually kind of a historical accident that has to do with Nintendo, actually. Right. In Nintendo censorship laws in the early 80s, um, where basically they would not allow any religion to be in there. And so, but I think if you actually, and, and so there's this kind of, um, I think, knee-jerk notion that video games don't have any religion in them. Yeah. But once you start looking at them, I mean, they're just overflowing with religion. Right. And, and right now, outside of the classroom, I think we're seeing in the industry, right, a, a kind of revival of the notion that uh, games can be explicitly religious. And some of the, the religious communities are making such games. Right. So you have you have kind of three different levels. One is the, you know, the AAA mainstream games in which... Like, uh, some examples, Call of Duty, maybe. Or... I don't know if there's any. I haven't, you know, I haven't played that enough to know if there's religion in there. Um, but you know, like Skyrim and yeah, Skyrim. Star Wars has, has it. Um, and there's, you know, so they're using religion for different reasons within the narrative and and and, and Skyrim procedural level. You know, so I mean, that you, to to it to win in to win in the game, you need to use shrines and things yeah, like that. Yeah, you do. If you become a member of the Daedric cult, you get certain powers, powers. that you would not have had otherwise. otherwise right. right. So, you, yeah, so become, you can become a werewolf if you join the cult right. of werewolves, right? Yeah, so there's, you know, there, there's qualities, there's religious qualities used at the procedural level and at the narrative level and at the audiovisual level. Right. And, um, and so there's that. And then there's games that are made by religious groups um, um, like the Left Behind series would be a really, you know, it's a terrible, it has terrible gameplay, but it's an example. Yeah, and those have been around for ever, for a long time. Yeah, but they're getting so much more sophisticated. Right. Yeah. So the original ones were kind of like um, uh, answer this Bible quiz, get to play the shooter game for a little bit, and now they're much more sophisticated in how they're training people using really procedural rhetoric and different ways. Um, and you do see this. Um, yeah. You, uh, uh, and then so there's there's and then there's and there's also independent games which you could call spirituals like Journey, yeah, um, or, or Dust, or Dust, yeah. Um, and then there's games like you know in the world of Warcraft where religion is used to justify the narrative structure of the world in which yes. you're in. Yeah. Um, why is there so much violence? Really, is what it comes right. down to. So the scholarship that's being done on it right now. Uh, are you able to bring that into the classroom, or are the games primarily in, in your classroom in these courses at least uh, uh, to discuss other issues? For instance, sacred architecture. As your earlier yeah, I do. So you know, so I do bring some of the scholarship in. I usually don't bring whole articles in. I bring pieces of articles in, um, and and so I'll bring some of the stuff that I've published or of stuff that other colleagues of mine have published. I'll bring those in, like. Uh, Vitz Sisler's, I'll bring in his notion of the video game as having three different levels, the procedural, the audiovisual, and the narrative, and I'll bring, you know, just a little section of so, that in. So the same kind of kernels that we might expect from more classical theoretical anal analyses, right? If we're going to talk about ritual, maybe we wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily make our students read all of the bare facts of rituals, ritual. But, but we might say to them, hey, ritual is an occasion to imagine the world as it is not. Right, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah, um, that's a good example. Yeah, so, you know, so, um, even there's, there's no textbook on at this point, there, but, so, but I do kind of pick and choose different readings and then p pair those up with, with assignments. So, have your students commented that, that this changes their own if they had a relationship with games previously? As, as it seems, the statistics suggest that almost everyone does. Does it change the way that they play games? Have they commented on this? Yeah, they say that, you know, again, um, part of my, Pedagogy is to make them think more critically about what they're doing, and yeah, so they play them more. They they see, and I think this works mostly for. Um, I do a whole a whole unit on using Butler and notions of performance and identity, and that one they really get into. Right. So when they are in the groups in the lab, and and you have one student that's observing another student play the game. Yeah. Uh, what kinds of things do the students? initially see in, in those kinds of interactions. Can you give me more of an example? So let's say um, you might not be playing Minecraft uh, for the building of sacred architecture class, yeah. but let's say you were entering Skyrim and you gave them a pass. It's, 
if you're watching another student do that... It's pretty fluid is the thing, and I guess, yeah. because they're handing the remote... I don't know if you've ever watched, like, a group of people play. Yes. They're handing the remote back and forth. Yeah. And, like, the one I really liked was there was this one, this one uh, student who was really good, but she did not like the violence. Yeah. And so the minute they, she would hand it off. <laughs> and so they're handing the stuff back and yeah. forth and looking stuff up. So it's really, it's really, it's dialogic between the group. It's not like, you know, everyone... It, so um, it's hard to pinpoint... Yeah. But that's exactly what I hoped you say because yeah. I had fear, right? Oh, I had yeah. Fear that it was somehow a bit more insult, right? I, I think I give them tasks because then they all engage with it more, you know, if you give them. But, but it really is, you know, I mean, it's this kind of fluid right. group. And, and the group work for me, um, it's, it's, for me, it's much more interesting because then I can walk around the room and enter into each of these different conversations and then kind of steer where they're going and ask them questions. It's like when you, you know, you, you have your students working on group work and you're, you're, Basically, mining the different tables. It's the same thing. I'll go and I'll I'll take over the controls for a while and play. And yeah. So when you when you come to select a game for using in class during those moments, what are the criteria <laughs> you use to select a game, and then within the game, select some moment that's accessible, right? That's a good question. Let me reflect on it for a moment. Yeah. Uh, I usually pick games I like. Yeah. Well. So I pick games that I've played a lot because they're going to ask me questions about them. And you want to know, know how to solve that quest or what's going to happen next in the story. Right. So if they get, you know, again, one of the, one of the hardest things in video games is when you, you get frustrated and, and you're not able to. And so I usually pick games that I've played and that I'm interested in, right? So, so if we're making this extensible to folks that maybe are not so much native gamers, Right, as you or I, or yeah. someone else who's really into video games is. What could they do? Do they have to play the game ahead of time? Are there other alternatives? No, I think I think Minecraft would actually be a good example. So I think you know using Minecraft to um, as another way of delivering certain concepts is really good. Um, what about the opportunity uh, that so many of us have participated in? And I know that perhaps you're participating in now uh, the Let's Play right. version of doing this. Yeah, so you know, so I've been I've been playing with so for people who don't know what Let's Play is, Let's Play is a genre of YouTube videos in which um, you watch someone else playing a video game, and this is really what most teenagers seem to do these days. They don't watch much TV; they actually watch other people doing things. Um, and, the, and the big difference between, and it's a walkthrough, and a walkthrough is um, kind of a step-by-step -step guide of how to walk through a video game, giving you all the, the things to do. Let's Play differs a little bit from a traditional walkthrough, because a traditional walkthrough is just all about strategy. You know, uh, you have to pick this thing up here, put this thing there, do this. It's giving you all kind of the procedural logic of the game. Let's Play is much more subjective, and it's really about the emotions of the person playing the game. The personality. The personality. And, it, and it, so you get these celebrities like PewDiePie who, he, you know, he's he making millions of dollars a year playing video games. I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Oh, well, I mean, I have to say that, that, that I do watch Let's Play. Yeah. Uh, in part, I watch them because some of the, the games that I play have modifications to them that are really, uh, they don't have manuals. Right. Uh, or they don't have effective manuals. Right. So how are you going to figure out how to do it in your own game? You need to watch somebody else do it. And that, that actually is now a new level of dialogue between the mod creators. Right. Who often stream rather than previously record and then post. And right. They stream the playing or even sometimes the creation of the mod to the game themselves. And if you hadn't watched those, you might not be able to solve <laughs> yeah, 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 no. Yeah, and so I, you know, I do this. Um, if I get stuck, and you know, I'll go pull my computer out, and I will look for how to do. It. I try not to because I think it ruins the game a little bit. But if if I'm getting really frustrated, uh, then I will go and. I think maybe you and I both have limits to our time, right? Yeah. The limits to the availability of our our, yeah. our gameplay, and, and so if if we're getting stuck on on a quest, right? Maybe it is more expeditious for us to go and solve. Right. Back in the day, that was the role of the of the game genie, right? Yeah. Co code code cheat. Uh, today, it seems a lot more accepted, perhaps because the games are a lot more open open world. Well, the, or... One the thing too is if you notice how. Um... Let me just say one thing about the let's go uh, let's play before we go on, which is so you know so what I've done is I basically make them make let's play videos, but 
the critical analysis of the game. Right. So they have to, this is, I, you know, that's the genre I give them, and then I say, you know, but turn this into an academic, uh, an academic uh, yeah, dissertation. Yeah. And, in, and, you know, and they get it because they've watched so many of it, and it's right. a way for them to feel comfortable using these terminologies in a format they're comfortable with. And they're hilarious, too. Do, do, they, do they then post these publicly? Or they... Yeah, so if you go to my website, um, uh, which is gpgrieve.org, there's a link over to some of the student work. Great. Um, and uh, and, and the, there's this complicated, I have this complicated final thing where there's all these different steps, and you can see how it works. Um, but yeah, but what were you saying before? Before I... Okay, so yeah, one of the interesting things that I've noticed is that there's the intended play, and then there's the actual play of the players, and they differ radically. And so like with Call of Duty, which people think of as this sh total shooter game, a lot of times if you actually watch what people are doing, they've like made hopscotch and, and the, all these kind of games within the game. And we, we, I used to be a member of a, a Call of Duty server, and, yeah. and the thing that we really like to do is have Jeep races yeah. in, in the game. Like totally, you would just let the time expire on the map right. and start over again. There was no right. yes. in it, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so I mean, there's the intended notion of what how these are going to be used, and then there's the kind of the creative innovation of the actual players, and it's the same thing. You know, if you if you have a playground, you know, people are gonna are going to they're going to innovate with what's what's in the playground. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today and talking about your experiences in the classroom. If uh, people would like to see uh, your student students' videos, yeah. what's the web address? Yeah, so it's it's gpgrieve.org and just that's the the, the homepage and then, and then grieve is G-R-I-E-V-E. -E. If you Google my name, I think it's the first that pops up. Perfect, and I hope that everyone enjoys those as much as we have, and I think they will find them hilarious too. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for your time. Wonderful to hear that interview there, Dave, and um, really good to hear about that sort of intersection between video games and religious studies rather than video games and religion, which he, David um, has some opinions on as that being quite a fraught field. The re religion and X market. Well, uh, exactly. We've talked about that quite a lot, yeah, but, um, yeah. but you've, you've actually written about the religion and video games. Yeah, Jonathan Tuckett and I co-wrote a paper talking about, um, well, the, it was a call for papers for a special edition of a journal talking about religion and computer games. And the basis of our article was, well, what exactly does that mean? And pointing out a, a number of different ways we could go about answering that question. So it's nice to see that we're not the only people <laughs> um, thinking about that. Um, you've been listening to this podcast for a while, perhaps, or perhaps today was your first time. Um, but Maybe you haven't ever watched the podcast. Watched a podcast, Chris? How would one do that? Um, well, one would go onto YouTube, presumably, and um, maybe find sort of dynamic video content. Um, no, we're not saying that we've suddenly started to video every podcast, but we have launched a Religious Studies Project YouTube channel. Yeah, so from, um, from now on, all of the uh, podcasts will be available through our uh, YouTube channel, Religious Studies Project. Um, you know, most of the time it won't be, it's just a static image, but they're there if you need them in a hurry and don't know where the site is or something. Exactly, and hopefully that will open us up to a broader audience and it will encourage us to um, really think about producing video content. We've been having a nice scheme before we started recording today, thinking about um, how potentially easy that could be. Um, so watch this space, and also, you know, the archive will gradually be being added. Uh, one um, one side effect of, of the switch to YouTube, however, is that we will have to be switching to a new Google Plus page. Um, <laughs> For the 33 people who were following us, I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to switch to um, a new page before we close the old one down. But um, I, I don't think we'd been updating it for quite some time, to be honest. So Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, maybe this will now be the sort of resuscitation of Google+. Plus. Indeed. So next week, um, we have the pleasure of bringing another Tommy Coleman interview, this time with Robert McCauley, um, talking about uh, method and theory and the cognitive science of religion, um, which is a really important topic um, as far as we are concerned. Um, Indeed. You know, cognitive sciences can seem this kind of, you know, sexy, 
more scientific approach. But if it's not done um, with appropriate um, method and theory uh, thinking, then it's just massive scanners and lighten up bits of the brain. Right, absolutely. It's uh, Cognitive science is absolutely as uh, guilty of uh, replicating folk categories and theological categories as any other uh, method and theory. Um, if you start with the assumption that you're going to find religion, you're going to find religion. Absolutely. So we're delighted to have that. And uh, uh, Bob McCauley was um, on the RSP before actually talking about um, how uh, religion is natural and science is not. Oh, of uh, course. It yeah. was that, that was one of our big hitters. Um, Tommy did well on that rhetorical title that time. So we're delighted to welcome um, Robert McCauley In, back. Indeed. But before that, come back on Thursday for a response to this uh, video games podcast from our friend Vivian Asimos, who um, we had the pleasure of meeting in Edinburgh. I think that's pretty much everything that we've got to say, though. So just as ever, remember about our Amazon links. If you're in the UK, Canada, or the USA, you can use those um, at no cost to you. It will benefit us greatly. Remember iTunes or whatever other portal that you listen to us on. Try and leave a rating. And we are on Facebook and Twitter. We think Alid's doing an excellent job at stepping into the social media. Don't forget Google+. Plus. <laughs> and YouTube. Exactly. Uh, social media editing role. Um, so do go along there and see what he's putting up and uh, leave a wee comment. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.